Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be giving you my top five games of 2017. Yes, you heard it right. I'm recording this in December 2018, and I'm covering my favourite games from 2017. The reason for this delay is one of many. Now, for those people who've been following me, they'll know that 2018 has been an extremely difficult year for one reason or another, for personal reasons, and unfortunately, a number of things had to keep getting pushed back. This is one of them. This was a goal of my Patreon campaign that I would release my top five games of 2017. We met that goal, therefore I feel I have an obligation to, to deliver what I promised. But also I wanted to do this anyway. So that's why there was a delay and I can't wait really any longer because I'm about to do my top favourite games of 2018. So just touching on my Patreon, as I mentioned, it was a goal of my Patreon. Um, a lot of the videos that I produce are not commissioned pieces of work. I spend a lot of time each month creating content through my Patreon campaign. So if you do enjoy the content that I create and you want to support the show, uh, I want to be aiming for sort of new things in 2019 and I kind of need your help in order to do so. So yeah, please consider checking out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. So on with this. This list is covering not just the games that I played in 2017, but the games which I played which came out in 2017. And since I'm gaming rules and I make the rules, I'm allowed to change those rules as I see fit. And I'm going to start with my fifth place game, or should I say games. I'm really bad at deciding on top tens or top five, so in fifth place I have four games that I can't decide between. Also, as you may have noticed, I've bashed my head recently and probably can't think straight, so that's my excuse for not being able to choose out of my fifth place. So the fifth place ties are Pulsar 2849, Gentis, Mini Rails and Dragon Castle. Now, let's start with Pulsar, and I'm probably going to get some criticism for this, since I do a lot of work for CG, I'm friends with the designer and family, and I was one of the developers of this game, but putting all that aside, which I feel that I'm able to do, I really like the game. It's rare for me to be 100% happy with the final result of a game which I've helped work on, but with this one, I am. And for those who think that I'm just shilling a game that I helped develop, I work on a lot of games each year, in one way or the other, and many of them I don't actually like. So this one I do. The game has a number of interesting choices, it has a nice flow, it's got a good playtime. The theme is mostly irrelevant, but I don't really care about theme in games anyway. So yeah, Pulsar 2849, really enjoy it. Gentis was on limited release in 2017 from Spielworks and is getting a new deluxe edition from Tasty Minstrel at some point. It's a Civ game, sort of. Again, the theme doesn't really matter, but I really enjoyed my few plays of Gentis. I love the mechanics of it and the choices presented to me. And again, the playtime was really good. Mini Rails is an interesting one. It's such a clever, simple game, and I love the way that the bare bones of an 18xx game have been boiled down to this 30 minute experience. And for that alone, I really rate the game. I guess it depends on your definition of a filler, really. Some people think a filler is 15 minutes, so I, and that's me. So I wouldn't really class this game as a filler game, but it's a very good short game. Now, games of this can go wrong based on the playgroup, because a random move by one player not really knowing what they're doing can completely screw you over. But the playtime is short, so highly recommended. That's Mini Rails, designed by Matt Garrett and published by Mo Ideas. And finally, Dragon Castle. And the reason this is on my list is for a few reasons. First, the game has really nice Ma Yong style tiles in it, and I quite like the original Ma Yong. But what's interesting is that most people, when they hear Ma Yong, think of the computer solitaire game, which is actually nothing like original Ma Yong. But what they've done with Dragon Castle is that they've created a game which is based on the computer game. So there's a familiar feeling to it for many people who've played that. The base game of it, without using the spirits and dragons, is a family game and the hobby needs more of them. It's simple rules but it's got choices and strategy in it and the playtime is short. And then the spirits and dragons, you've still got a family game but a sort of a family plus game. It's got a bit more crunch to it. I've played it loads and I want to continue to play it. Great game and better than Azul in my opinion. Okay moving on to my number four game of 2017 and this time there is only one and it's Spirit Island from designer Eric Roos and published by Greater Than Games. Ten years ago I didn't see the point of cooperative games. Not worth bothering with, not really games. Oh how things have changed. Spirit Island is not only my top four game of 2017, but my favourite cooperative game of all time. That's not to say that if you like cooperative games, you should rush out and buy it. Why? Because it's quite meaty. 
games can take a while and I don't think I'd ever want to play this game with four players again. The, the, the brain just exploded. The game has a reputation for being hard, but let's take a look at some of the cooperative games that are known to be hard. Ghost Stories, The Grizzled, Pandemic on hard difficulty, for example. Yes, they're hard, but how much of that is just down to the way that the cards come out? Now, I'm not saying that Spirit Island doesn't have some randomness, it does a bit, but much of it is player decisions, planning, the way that you see ahead of time what the invaders are going to do allows you to play and plan a couple of turns ahead. The basic scenario in the book is hard when you first play it and you're learning the rules. But once you know the game, you should always be able to beat that initial scenario. That's no problem. The real game comes when you include the invaders and the scenarios. And each of those has variable difficulty settings, so you can really customise the game to find a setup that's challenging for you, and always try and beat it, and then try the next one up. The different spirits, the way that they evolve as the game goes on, and the way that it's... For me, it's, it's a real co-op. You're not just working together to try and achieve the goal. You're directly having to combo your powers with each other. Oh, I can move two of these things from here to here. Oh, and then you've got a card which destroys all invaders in that area. So I'll do my bit and then you do your bit. It's just great how players have to really work together to try and achieve the goal of that scenario. And let's just touch on the theme. Now, I've already said I don't really care about theme in games. And if this game had a different theme, I'd probably still enjoy it because of the mechanics of the game. But saying that, the theme is really nice. The idea that there are spirits living quietly on this island and then it gets invaded and the spirits have to you know, wake up to help defend the land, it's just really cool. And the theme is there in the game too with the way that the spirit powers work together. Now, I'm talking about this game now and really <laughs> makes me want to play it. My number three game is another one that some people might call me out on because I'm friends with the designer and I helped work on the game. But it is my third favourite game that came out in 2017 and that's Lisboa from Vital Lacerda and Eagle Griffin Games. And let's first talk again about the theme. There is so much theme in this game, although unless you look under the cover, you're just going to see the numbers and moving cubes around. But if you let Vittel sit down with you and start telling you about it, and believe me, I didn't really have a choice, you will see the amount of historical significance in every mechanic of the game. The clearing of rubble, the collection of the sets, the way that the shops were built, the way that the officials are needed to open the public buildings, and so on. And the fact that Vittel lives in Lisboa, and that this is based on a historical event, and this is coming from the person who said that the theme really doesn't matter in games. And it doesn't. If there was a game about the reconstruction of Lisboa, and it was a, a take that card playing party game that took 15 minutes, then I'm not interested. But this is a deep, heavy, crunchy Euro that's going to take you about four or so hours for your first game and it'll be a big learning curve. But saying that, once you know the game, it does go a lot quicker. I've played some two player games in this in under 90 minutes. I can't decide if Lisboa or Vinyos Second Edition is my favourite Vital Lacerda game. I really enjoy both of them, but it's certainly one of my favourite games of 2017. Now, my gaming tastes have changed over the years, and 10 years ago, there is nothing that I enjoyed more than a six hour, epic, heavy Euro game, but things have changed, and games in the last few years have started to offer a different type of experience. Both me and my generally non-game playing partner, Vicky, have always liked puzzle games, especially the point and click computer games like the Myst series. And in the last decade, escape room games have become a thing, which is basically one of our favorite things to do in the world. So escape room style games were always going to be something that we'd enjoy doing. I've played many of the Exit series and many of the Unlock series and a few other ones. Which of the Exit and Unlock is my favourite? Well, I've spent a year thinking this over and I still can't decide. So I'm going to break my own rules again and I'm going to say both of them. Unlock uses the app not only as a timer but also for hints and for some of the puzzles. Exit just uses the physical components inside the box and you need to provide a timer yourself if you want to use a timer. We've enjoyed playing both of those games a lot, and if you like escape room style games, then I would say that both of them are a must have. It's interesting to find fans of one really disliking the other and vice versa. To me, they provide a very similar experience. Now, some individual scenarios are much better than others. If I was to rate the unlock scenarios on a scale of one to 10, for example, some of them have been really, really good, like eight or nine out of 10. Whereas other ones I really didn't like, even though I enjoyed the experience of playing an escape room game, a couple of them we weren't big fans of. The puzzles in both of those games are similar in the way that they're clever, you need to think about them logically, 
we've got really stuck on some of the puzzles in both games and we've had to use the hint system sometimes to literally tell us what the answer is. And even then, a couple of them we were like, what? That's really obscure. You're never going to get that. Some people do, but, but not us. So the fact that these games contain a hint system is really good. It allows us to carry on playing them. So yeah, I can't really decide out of those two series of games which one is my favourite, so I'm going to bundle, all them, bundle them together as my second favourite game of 2017. And my number one game should be no surprise to anyone. A game that not only do I think is a masterpiece of a design, but one that is simply more than just a game. Something that has provided me so far, at the time of filming this video, about 150 hours of enjoyment, and that is going to continue for quite a while longer. A game which on paper is a tactical kill all enemies type dungeon bash game, but it ends up being so much more. The game of course is Gloomhaven, and yet here I go again talking about a game where I know the designer, but whatever. Anyone who knows me knows that my honesty and integrity are very important to me. So if you think that I'm just saying this game was my favourite game of 2017 just because I'm friends with the designer, then, then I'm not. I was lucky enough to bring the game back from Essen 2016, and we started playing in November 2016, but it was a 2017 release, which is why it's on this list. Gloomhaven comes in a big box and is expensive. Okay, so lots of games come in big boxes these days. That doesn't make them good. And it's expensive. Well, is it? I mean, there's games in boxes this size that are hundreds of pounds or, or dollars. Any other publisher, I think, would have spent five years to release this much content over many expansions, and the end cost would have been hundreds. In this game, you get 17 character classes, each of which have about 30 individual unique cards that make that character play in a very different way. You get 95 scenarios, and each one of them is fully playable with two to four players of any level. So you can play a scenario with two level one characters or four level nine characters, and it scales. Now, sure, a lot of the scenarios are just kill all enemies, but of the 34 scenarios that I've currently played, only two of them felt a little similar. And that's because of the different monsters, the special rules and the layout means that you need to approach every scenario differently, using different tactics each time. Everything is like a little puzzle, and you know how much I like puzzles. With two cards to play, how to resolve my actions, when to rest, where to move, and then on top of that, you've got the campaign with the character progression leveling up, a branching storyline, side quests, events, personal goals. And on top of that, you've got the Town Records book with another ongoing backstory. It's just insane the amount of stuff that's going on in this game. And the setting, sure, it's fantasy, but it's the most non-generic setting I've seen. There's no elves and dwarves, and there isn't a random race where you can say, oh yeah, well that's just the elf equivalent. No. Isaac has handcrafted an entire world with so many different races that really feel very different from the norm. Now, don't get me wrong, the game isn't perfect. There's some bits about it which I'm not too keen on. Minor things, and we play with a few house rules to tweak those things a little bit here and there. I think the game doesn't scale perfectly as you level up. The game comes with ways that you can increase or even decrease the difficulty, and at higher levels I think you really need to play at plus one or plus two, otherwise it's a little bit too easy. I think the first scenario is too hard. I mean, it's not, it's a balanced scenario, but it should have been made easier as this will be people's first introduction to the game. But these are just minor things. Gloomhaven has changed my life. And that might sound really overdramatic and silly, but our Gloomhaven group has been meeting up every few weeks now, and that group includes Vicky, my generally non-game playing partner, who absolutely loves the game. We're all progressing through the storyline, we're advancing our characters, we're retiring those characters, we're getting new characters, embarking on new things all the time, and with no end in sight. We've even done what some people would say is the end of the campaign, and I was concerned that once we'd done that scenario, the other players might want to stop playing, but oh no, they didn't. Although we wrapped up that what considered is the end of the main storyline, Gloomhaven is a living, breathing world, and there's so much more to do. One of my favourite parts of the game is the road and city events, things that happen which sometimes cause repercussions afterwards. About a year ago, when we were on the way to some mountains, we found a <laughs> which we decided to bring back to town. And that option told us to shuffle in a new city event into the city deck. And at some point, that card, that city event, is going to come up and we don't know what it is. And that's just one of many things that are happening in the, in the game. And this is on the side of the 95 scenarios and the main storyline. There's so much extra stuff going on. We met a guy and he told us to and then we did something else and, and there's all of these things going on. 
So yeah, aside from the 95 scenarios, the ongoing multiple storylines, the Town Records book, there's lots of other little side stories with the event cards. I could go on for hours about this game, and many of you have probably heard me talk about this game now for two years if you've caught me at a convention. I'll never forget the time after picking the game up at closing time of Essen 2016, I stopped by the Dice Tower booth to show the game to Tom Vassell, because I'd mentioned it previously to him, and I wanted to physically show him what the game was about. Imagine my surprise when he named it like his number one game of all time the year afterwards. Another funny story is one which Vicky reminded me about a few weeks ago. She said, oh, remember when Gloomhaven was on Kickstarter the first time round and you backed it, but then you were having second thoughts about it, saying, oh, it looks like you're going to need to play it quite a lot, and, and I just don't think we're going to find the time. Well, I'm quite glad that that turned out different from what I imagined it would be. I have so many good things that have come out of this game. It's hard to, to fully explain things, but trying to put all of that personal connection aside, the game itself is just really good. It combines the elements of a fantasy RPG that I no longer have time for, even though I said I've spent 150 hours playing this, and you might think, oh, well, if he's got that amount of time, why doesn't he just go and play a role-playing game? Well, role-playing games require a GM, they require a lot more investment of time and effort to write scenarios and play through scenarios, and Gloomhaven, for me, it's not a role-playing game, okay? It's, it's a board game that has role-playing game style aspects to it. We don't play it as a role-playing game, we don't put on voices, we don't act out in characters, we just play the game as a game, but it scratches that RPG itch that I've been missing for quite a few years. The ongoing storyline, the character progression, mixing that with a very Euro-inspired card management system, giving you such interesting decisions. The tactical nature of the way that a round plays out, the randomness of dice being replaced by your attack modifier deck, which, sure, is still a random card draw, but the fact that you can customise this deck and as the character progresses and each character develops their deck in a very different way, Gloomhaven is one of my favourite games of all time and will likely to be that for a long time. So, that is my top five games of 2017, although I did cheat slightly and it's actually probably my top nine games, but never mind, moving on. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and as I mentioned at the start, if you do enjoy the content that I create, then please consider supporting me on Patreon to allow my channel to grow and to make more content moving forward to next year. And if you have any comments or thoughts or queries on the games that I've covered, then please let me know in the show notes below, or just pop around for a coffee and we can have a chat about it and probably play Spirit Island. Until next time, Take care, and thanks for watching. Gaming Rules is proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com.